Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Battle of Val Valis Valadunes, 1047 AD, Early Years of William the Conqueror, Part 1. Preemptive like, History March, phenomenal. Get ready to learn, let's do it. Nice map. The name William the Con Conqueror evokes thoughts of 1066 and the... And guys, uh, there's a lot of construction like going around me upstairs, and, and so uh, you might see, hear some hammer sounds, but shouldn't be too bad. Iconic battle. The name William the Conqueror evokes thoughts of 1066 and the iconic Battle of Hastings. William seizing the throne from King Harold and establishing a dynasty that would last 88 years. However, every icon of history has their beginnings and William's first great struggle was for the mastery of his own duchy. Still only 19 years old, the young duke had the support of King Henry I and other influential nobles. But several of William's kingsmen, including Guy of Burgundy, his cousin, believed themselves to have a better claim to the title. A large coalition of Norman barons formed to take control of the duchy by force. William will have to fight to retain his title. This illustration is from about 200 years after Valedun, showing a battle between French and Norman forces. Texts like this are known as illuminated manuscripts, and they're some of the most important artifacts from the medieval period. And they're still extremely valuable. In fact, an illuminated manuscript from the 15th century sold for a whopping $575,000 back in 2016. But holding on to art like this goes further than appreciating history. It can yeah, help you defend that, your sure. wealth and prepare for your That's another one of my hey videos, guys, guys. Uh, from recommended channel. Blah, 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 blah. Your future other than appreciating history. It can help you defend your wealth and prepare for your future. Markets worldwide are in ruins and with a recession looming, the art market I mentioned before. <laughs> oh, wow, that was a good transition into an ad. A really good transition into an ad when I don't even think it's a transition into an ad until I'm already in it. Very well done. Um, make sure to use the masterworks.art slash history march if you're trying to invest. Is seeing record numbers. And 85% of wealth managers recommend art as part of a wealth offering, according to Deloitte. So what do you do as an investor yourself to get into the fine art market? If you're like me, you go to the only platform you trust for art investing, Masterworks. They let you invest in a portion of high-value paintings through a fractional approach. Their SEC... Is they that the... There's the Parthenon and the Pantheon? What's the difference? ...to invest in a portion of high-value paintings through a fractional approach. Their SEC-qualified offerings include some of the biggest artists in the world, like Picasso and Banksy. And they've delivered over 30% net IRR so far to their investors from the sale of three paintings. Past performance is no guarantee of future results, but 30% is pretty incredible in this market. No wonder they're already a startup unicorn and have over 470,000 users. If you want to get started with... My if you buy a really nice piece of art that's like one of a kind, like a Picasso, are you allowed to like draw on it or like paint over it if you for some reason obviously it's a hypothetical but i mean it's your painting now but then it's picasso so it, once you buy it like you can like do whatever you want with it just a curious masterworks it only takes a few clicks and you can even get priority access to skip their wait list if you use the link in the description invest in blue chip art for the very first time by signing up for masterworks Okay. In early 1035, William's father, Duke Robert the Magnificent, bade farewell to both William and his errant vassals, setting off for the Holy Land and leaving the government in the steady hands of Robert, his uncle, and the Archbishop of Rouen. Before leaving, he also gathered the Norman magnates, having them swear an oath to recognize William as their future ruler. However, this clearly irked some of his kinsmen. 
At this point, it is useful to consider young William's parentage, as this would provide the casus belli for William's early enemies. William's illegitimacy may have divided opinion, but at the time attitudes were still ambiguous. Normandy itself had been established in 911 by treaty, by William's Viking ancestor Rollo, and taking wives in the Danish manner was hardly unheard of. Though the practice was a source of unease for men like William of Jumierge, one of the main sources for William's life. Indeed, Duke Robert had never found a suitable wife, though he had had a liaison with a girl from the town of Falaise called Haleva. Fulbert, her father, has been described as an undertaker and commonly a tanner. Sorry, I wanted to read this. Haleva went on to marry Herluin de Conteville in 1031 AD mothering two prominent sons, Odo, Bishop of Bayou, Bayeux, uh, and Robert, Count of Mortain. Okay. Even so, this illegitimate status and the perceived lack of a strong sword behind ducal authority would set the stage for the first rebellions against young Duke William's rule. As for Duke Robert himself, he did make it to Jerusalem, though he died at Nicaea on the return journey leaving his bastard son William his successor back home. Unfortunately for the boy Duke, Archbishop Robert was an elderly man who did not long outlast his nephew. He died in 1037, and the duchy became a decidedly more dangerous place for the young William. Unlicensed Because he was sort of a shoe-in before he died? Castles appeared with no young William. Unlicensed castles appeared with no central authority to keep local rivalries in check. Magnates fought to gain the upper hand over each other, with Orderic Vitalis providing us with a particularly gruesome gain. The hey, I've been to Laharve right there, and then Normandy is right here. Her, her. The upper hand over each other, with Orderic Vitalis providing us with a particularly gruesome account of one William Garoy, who was seized by his enemies at a wedding feast and had his nose and ears cut off, as well as his eyes gouged out. Hey. William himself had been appointed various guardians, but they proved of little avail. The most powerful died quickly, with Alan the Duke of Brittany falling in a siege in 1040, and the Count of Brion, Gilbert, assassinated while on a morning ride. More personal stewards fared no better, with his tutor Tyrold murdered in 1041, and his household steward Osborne having his throat slit, apparently while he slept in the same chamber as the young duke himself. Orderic Vitalis once again provides a colourful annotation, put in William's own mouth and supposedly uttered years later on his deathbed. Many times I was smuggled secretly out of the castle at night by my uncle Walter. I've never even seen a full episode of Game of Thrones, but this this all sounds kind of Game of Thronesy. Just bl stabbings and stuff. Many times I was smuggled secretly out of the castle at night by my uncle Walter, and taken to the cottages and hiding places of the poor, to save me from discovery by traitors who sought my death. Just. Just, uh... Matters darkened around 1043, when the French king sponsored a rebellion in the heart of Normandy itself. A Viscount had been so bold as to seize William's birthplace of Falaise, and King Henry I even invaded the south of the duchy to support this move. What is significant is that the decision to move against the threat was William's, an early demonstration of his steely resolve. William had come of age, and was invested with arms by his erstwhile enemy King Henry himself. William's relationship with his nominal overlord would prove crucial in the coming years. William's father Robert had gained Henry's recognition of him as his heir, Robert having forged a bond with Henry by harboring him for a time from the faction of his mother Constance. Stop scaring me. William was likely knighted by Henry in the period of 1041 to 43, with 1042 or roughly his 15th year, generally being the age settled, settled upon. Bond with Henry by harboring him for a time from the faction of his mother Constance, who favored his younger brother. At least the most joyful day dawned splendidly for all who desired and eagerly awaited peace and justice.
Our Duke, adult more in his understandings of honorable things than in the strength of his body that, than in age, was armed as a knight, William of Poitiers. Robert as king. <laughs> Yet support yeah. for William did not necessarily translate to support for those men surrounding him. In the following years up to 1047, William removed many from his entourage, with two new major lieutenants emerging by the mid-1040s, in the persons of William Fitz Osborne and Roger of Montgomery. I want to say something. Uh, so I've br I brought up the trip. I've t guys, I, I only have, I've only been to Europe twice, and there's only one time that's been recent enough for me to remember. And so whenever I have to bring up a personal experience or like I've been there, yeah, I've always got to revert back to this story because it's the only trip I've had. So me, my dad, and my brother went in like 2014, 15, 16. Something like that. And we drove around Europe. Like, we went to Heathrow, went through the Channel, went to visit our uh, great, great uncles. Uh, he died on, on uh, Omaha Beach, visited the grave there, beautiful cemetery, and drove around Europe. And during the time, I, I loved history during the time, like I do now, I, I was very into World War II. And so I saw a lot of traveling through that sort of lens. I wanted to see certain things that had to do with World War II, sometimes World War I, like the Maginot Line. But I'd like to go again with more of like a Roman and uh, just uh, learning about different historical time periods to kind of get a different experience to go through, if that makes sense. With such faithful men at his side, William began reigning in the rebellious lords who had in all the years of his minority simply ignored his government. The year of 1047 was the breaking point. In late 1046, another rebellion sparked, this time with the objective of killing and replacing William as Duke. William's cousin Guy was a legitimate grandson of Duke Richard. He was raised with William in the dual household and was likely a figurehead around which the Western Viscounts and Noble rallied. The second, and led a disgruntled group of Viscounts from Western Normandy who were not about to allow their young overlord to assert his own authority over them. Unfortunately, no contemporary source delves into any of the details of the battle and events, though luckily a Norman historian writing around a century later, called Wace, does provide us with a vivid account. Does provide us. Wace was a Norman poet who lived and wrote the Roman de Brut, which covers these events during the reign of King Henry II which is likely true in its essential narrative, given the other known facts about the time. Trouble erupted while William rested in the western town of Valognier. According to Wace, he was abruptly woken from his- What are these islands over here? Wace informs us that William was warned of imminent danger by a fool named Galay. Right, warned. Slumber and warned of the approach of Guy's rebels. It was a close-run thing, with William scarcely dressed in just his breeches and shirt, and barely having time to fasten on a cloak before fleeing ingloriously on a horse into the night. He rode hard, reaching Hello, the well. church of St. Clement near Isigny, where Thanks he sure. caught his breath and prayed for a safe route away from his pursuers, before crossing the Via River and reaching Re before sunrise. At Re, the fugitive duke was fortunate wait, to encounter... Wait, wait, what did I miss? William took this route to avoid Bio... Bio? Itself, given he did not know who to trust, according to Wace. Yeah, so wait. I was following just the blue and red colors, but Grimold, the guy who went to... He's the guy who went to warn William? He's in red. And why isn't he on his side? Hubert, a loyal local... At Re, the fugitive duke was fortunate to encounter Hubert, a loyal local lord, who furnished the Duke with a fresh horse, as well as the guard of his three sons, before remaining on the bridge to meet with William's pursuers. Hubert then led them astray, while William escaped to his birthplace of Falaise. Having failed in their ambush at Valognier, Guy and the Viscounts quickly seized control of Western Normandy and raised an army to contest William. As for William, Unlike in his earlier years of rule, he would not be shunned about from castle to castle, instead seeking the aid of his overlord, King Henry, who had agreed to his accession 
and personally invested him with arms. This was a shrewd move on William's part. William was Henry's vassal, which entailed Henry protecting and aiding him, and so the king mustered an army and marched to William's aid in early 1047. I'm sorry, but how is that exactly shrewd uh, when he didn't seem to have another choice? Shrewd means smart, right? Shrewd. Having or showing sharp powers of judgment. I mean, I, I, he knows more than me. Where am I? No? Yes. William had also mustered as many men as he could in the east, and the two set out to confront the rebels who had amassed their own sizable force near Khan at a place called Valadun. The battlefield was a wide, flat area, devoid of woods or rocks. Perfect ground for the cavalry clashes that would characterize the battle. Norman cavalry training was performed in groups of around half a dozen men, the proto-knights of the era having long swapped out their long ships for war horses. The Conroy was the basic combat unit, consisting of around 20 to 30 riders arranged two or three ranks deep. With the use of flags for command and control, these units, contributing to the larger army, could perform controlled charges, flanking maneuvers, and even feigned retreats, though the last of these is highly contentious. The knights of both these units can look at these maps, guys. It makes me cry. Tears of joy. Contributing to the larger army could perform controlled charges, flanking maneuvers, and even feigned retreats, though the last of these is highly contentious. The knights of both armies. Guys, they're even following the paths. They're even following the paths. And that might sound like duh, but I mean, they wouldn't have had to. They could have not left any of the roads in here and just kind of had them move over. But nope, it has beautiful roads, amazing topography. The most important thing for me is topography because that gives you a little bit of insight and can guess, you know, where should they go, whatever. But when a channel like History March, that I have to say, Epic History TV is my number one favorite channel. Uh, but this channel has the best maps and best battle scenes. Bar none. Armies would have fought with spears, shields, and swords, as we see depicted around two decades later in the Bio Tapestry. The typical Norman knight would have been trained from a young age with even the horses themselves specifically bred to carry their armored masters. The spears were used for thrusting, but were often thrown as javelins too. Again, as seen- If you guys see me like going from here to here, I have a big screen. You're just, I don't wanna, so don't, don't worry, okay? In the bio town, but were often thrown as javelins too. Again, as seen in the bio tapestry. The rebels under the overall leadership of Guy advanced from the west near the river Orne, while Ralph Tesson of Thury converged with them from the southwest. Wace informs us that Ralph Tesson defected back to William on the eve of the battle. And the direction of the Lays River. The outnumbered army. Ah, I need to shut up. The river Orne, while Ralph Tesson of Thury converged with them from the southwest and the direction of the Lays River. The outnumbered army of Duke William and King Henry, meanwhile, also converged from separate routes. King Striking William with his glove to fulfill a vow he made to strike him if he met him, he kept the vow but fought, off, fought for the Duke. Well, yeah, that was probably a, a laughing moment. King Henry's marching through Mesodon across the Laison River, and then through Valmarais across the Muons to the site of the battle just north of Contville. William himself joined Henry from the direction of Arjonse. King Henry and his Frenchmen clashed with the men of the Catentin under Nigel, thrusting wildly with spears, and when these were broken or thrown, drawing swords. At this point, King Henry was struck from his horse by an unknown Norman knight, though he fell into his own ranks and was quickly remounted. 
The unfortunate assailant, however, was trampled by Frenchmen after being surrounded and thrown down. The king then rode throughout his men, encouraging and striking hard at the Normans, aware that any rumor of his fall may cause his men to despair and flee the field. Next to engage Henry was Hamon Dentatus, the rebel lord of Thoringi, who also managed to unhorse the king. An unnamed and enraged French knight in turn charging at him and striking him dead. As for William, a colorful description has him rushing in, then he spread such terror by his slaughter that his adversaries lost heart and their arms weakened. Indeed, the furious young duke charged at Hade, a vassal of Viscount Ranulf himself, driving his sword into the area between his throat and chest, his armor proving useless. It was also a Guys, um, whenever, you know, like, when it comes to historians who are under the rule of, of some king or some important general in a battle, I'm not saying that it has that it can't be seen as legitimate, especially if it's the only thing we have. But how many people do you think that have ever existed have the tendency to want themselves to be shown in a better light than reality might say? And I don't think it's a very big leap to think that obviously they have history just like we do. They know how people are remembered. And are you telling me that it's 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 safe to bet they wouldn't force historians to write well on them. And I'd really like to hear what you guys have to say about that. Around this point that Ralph Tesson, who had positioned himself to the southwest, struck his former allies. Ranulf after this realized which way the day was turning and led the withdrawal from the fighting. Though as knights peeled off from combat, this devolved into a rout. The royal army followed. Like you know, the phrase "history is ri is w written by the victor." I, I don't really even mean to go that far because just saying that makes it seem like you can't trust anything that was said by a historian who was under the dominion of a winning of the winning side, right? You you can't just say, "Okay, history is written by the victors," therefore everything is skewed and not correct. I doubt any single thing in history, pre. I doubt every I doubt I doubt anything in history is completely fact. Maybe I'm going a little bit too far by saying everything, but um I think history is about is a very scientific subject in the way that it is thought and um talked about. And you have to you uh, the the completely impartial people historians have never existed so you can't wish for that or say screw it we can't just we can't even learn about history because it's all bullcrap you can't do that but always i think many things in history should have an asterisk to them great mass of fugitives west as they attempted flight across the orn many being cut down or drowned so that the mills downstream became clogged with the press of dead bodies the battle proved a resounding success for William, though the victory was largely Henry's, and also crucially a result of Ralph Tesson's defection. Count Guy, the revolt's nominal leader, fled the field to his own castle of Briand, where William besieged him for around three years, before subduing him and then allowing him to return to Burgundy. Another rebel leader, Grimold of Plessis, was not so lucky. It had been Grimold who had been personally responsible for the assassination attempt on William at Valognier. Oh, I thought it was Grimold who, who gave him the heads up. Having been captured, Duke imprisoned and then later executed him as an example. Grimold's unlicensed... I love how he uses kitchen knives. Castle... Uh, uh, history march. ...was also destroyed, among others. Castle later executed him as an example. Grimold's unlicensed castle was also destroyed, among others. So Grimold's castle in ruin was ruined? Get it? Okay. 
With his victory at Valadar, the young Duke William of Normandy had vindicated his right to rule. In the autumn after the battle in nearby Caen, William convened a great council of his magnates and bishops, where a truce of God was proclaimed. Now private warfare was restricted to certain days of the week, which would serve to curb the violence and disorder suffered during his minority, with William, of course, exempted from this prohibition. The balance of power had decisively shifted, though William was far from secure in his power and would have many more years of struggle ahead of him on his ultimate path towards the throne of England. Is Amsterdam not a thing um, in 1052? Because it seems to be showing like big Londons, like, I mean, big, big uh, cities. Paris, Reims, Aachen, Bruges, Boulogne, Boulogne, London, Winchester, Exeter. And I would have thought it would say Amsterdam, but maybe Amsterdam isn't big yet. If you've made or it this Antwerp far or into the video, thank you for watching. And if you'd like to support our work like all these amazing people do, head over to our Patreon page where you can get ad-free early access to our videos for as little as $1. Or you can support us by subscribing to our channel. Awesome video, guys. Fantastic. If you can answer my questions, uh, you guys are my training wheels, and I'd really appreciate it. Or just leave a comment, see what happens. Join the Discord, we'd love to have you. Make sure to subscribe to History March if you're, I, I'd highly recommend it. If you're interested in history at all, they are phenomenal. All right, I'm gonna, I'll just, I'm gonna do a Epic History TV video. Bye, guys.